so the the evil the evil deadlock rears its head. Um, again, as we talked about before, deadlock was an issue when we weren't thinking about distributed transactions, and it gets even becomes more of an issue now. Um, so let's let's think about um, some ways to get around it and what what the sort of the key issues are that make it difficult. Centralized detection. Centralized detection says that there's some sort of deadlock detector that communicates with these servers that are any server that can be in this in this distributed transaction system. And what it does is it goes around asking them, you know, what kinds of locks are you holding right now? And it does this on a regular basis and it gets back this list of partial of locks. So this guy might say, well, I'm uh, on server A and I'm, I'm holding a lock on object B. And, you know, I'm sort of holding a lock on objects. Let me name these a little differently. Object one, object two. I'm over here on server B and I'm holding a lock on object three, object four. <clears throat> what other piece of information do you need besides where, what you have locks on in order to detect deadlock? What you need locks for. What you need locks for. So this one says B. Um, you know, I'm waiting for a lock on uh, object five. So it might be C. I'm waiting for a, a lock on object one, and so on. Now, how would you? How? What is the? What? What happens at this point once you have all that information? W what kind of data structure can you put pull together very easily with this? Graph. Pardon? Graph. Excellent. So you have this graph. Now, what property of this graph are you going to look for? That 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 to detect deadlock? Cycle. cycle. Any cycle in this graph is going to be a deadlock, potential deadlock. So you guys know how to do the, you guys probably have like five algorithms in your back pocket to do this at this point, right? Okay. Um, so if this graph is, you know, if it's sparse, if it's dense, you can, you can decide what you want to use. Um, what's the problem here with this? With this? What assumptions being made here if, if for, this, for this to actually work? Think about our failure model. This is an asynchronous network. But you don't have processes that have locks that are, that are holding locks that are dead that won't tell you they have the lock anymore. So that's one of them is that there may be some, you may, this, this process may have died and then it's got, you know, who, who knows what was, it may die before or after you hear from it and you have to, you have to know what it's going to do with its locks. Um, so let's, let's think about that type of, that type of failure. Um, which is either it dies or what's the other, even if it doesn't die, what can, what can it do immediately after you've asked for it, the add information? It can just change, it can time out or it can do, it can just release the lock or try to get some other lock. So the problem here is that this model assumes that this server here is going to be able to grab a consistent snapshot of the whole system at once. So anytime someone says, I want to grab a consistent snapshot of a distributed system, like, <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> so, uh, so the, the thing, so what, what can you get into here? Um, you can get into what are um, called phantom deadlocks or false positives. So you can have a false positive where um, one of these uh, here, say we had, um, say B, say we had a situation where, it, where we, had, we held these locks and then A, was also waiting for, um, oh, let's say it's waiting for, let's create a deadlock. A is waiting for O3, and B has O3. So what do we have to have B waiting for to, to create a deadlock? O1. O1. So let's say what happens is that we come over here and we, we detect this. And then, actually, let's take this one out. Let's make this example pretty easy. You detect this. So you're like, okay. Then what happens is by the time you're, you get over to B, A's already gotten rid of this. Right? Then over here when you get to B, you say, so now you say, okay, well, in, in the, the DD here, the, the deadlock detector is going to say, okay, well, A depend is, look, is, has O1. And um, B is waiting for... O1, 
And let's say uh, we have to put one here. A is waiting for O3. A is waiting for O3. So then what, are you, what, what happens? Well, you say, well, if A has O1, so if O1, O3, and A has, A has this one, right? B is waiting for this one. B has O3, then you have a deadlock, right? Because you have two resources that are waiting for, um, two, these two are waiting, this one's waiting for, uh, for O1. A has O3, B has O3, B's not going to release O3 until, um, until it's got all of its locks, so boom. But along the way, if between the time that you did that, A released O1, it timed out or some, you know, there can be lots of reasons, then the deadlock detector is going to think there's this deadlock around and it's going to say, you know, deadlock detection and it's going to go off and try to kill locks or do whatever it can to, to get, to pull these guys out, even though there was no issue to begin with. So the, again, the reason this, this thing, that you have this problem is because states, these, these states of these locks can change as you go through and try to figure out what everybody has. And so there's going to be no consistent global state that you can get at one time unless you quiesce the whole system. Right. Have you guys, have you guys heard this thing, this term of quiescing the system? Quiescing the system means basically you put a, you, you lock down the whole system and say, I'm not going to let anything happen until I figure out what the state of everything is. Right? So, exactly. <laughs> so, it, that's a great, what's that? I'm just driving on the family trip. Ah. <laughs> right. Everything, the world stops. <laughs> So what you um, so in the middle when you're when you're creating this this type of data structure, it's not going to be you're going to have pieces of it that are more out of date than others, and you can imagine a deadlock could be could be created um, even even while this thing is going through and you won't even see it because something got created after it scanned that piece of the of the uh, of the server graph. So centralized systems centralized type of detection isn't going to work too well. Um, but there are things that you can do to try to help you to not get into these deadlock situations. And one of them we talked about yesterday, which was this two-phase locking. You grab all the locks that you're going to grab before you start your transaction. I'm sorry, you grab all the locks. That, the strict two-phase locking is you grab everything that you're going to grab before you start the transaction. You do what you need to do, and then you release everything at the end. Standard two-phase locking is a little bit more... Uh, is a little bit more forgiving than that, which is that you don't release any lock until after you've grabbed everything that you're going to grab. So then you can interleave operations, but there's still this demarcation between when you when you acquire and when you release. And the reason that something like two-phase uh, strict two-phase locking helps you prevent deadlocks is if you're in the acquisition phase and you haven't done anything yet. It's easy. It's easier for you to, to um, as you're trying to get locks. If you get to this point here, and you're actually doing the work, then you know that you have all the locks that you have that you need in order to get that work done. If you're if you're in the lock acquisition phase and you're not and you're having trouble getting the locks, well, you can always time out and say, okay, I, I'm releasing all the locks because some for some reason I'm not getting all of these. But since you haven't done any work at that point. It's, there's really the cost of backing out is, is low. You don't have to go out there and undo a lot of stuff and, and send a lot of messages out. Um, and similarly down here, you release them all at the same time. If you, if you do strict two-phase locking where you release them all at the same time, then there's no work in the middle here that might cause you to say, oh, wait, I have to you know, wait on this blocking operation. So they all get acquired at once, released at once. Remember how we did lock ordering? or mutual exclusion ordering, so you can actually introduce priorities. That's another technique that you can use up here is to say each lock, the locks are ordered, I'm going to grab them in a particular order, and we all, all of us here have priorities over who gets it over somebody else. So in that point, if you're in the acquisition phase, it allows you to determine more quickly whether or not you're going to be able to succeed or whether you have to wait for someone else to release it. These kinds of things are, are uh, we've seen before. Um, some of them are covered in the book. 
Uh, but there is, the, the, unfortunately, it's one of those things where dead, when someone says, "I can, you know, I can, I have solved the deadlock problem," you have to, you have to really think about it a bit seriously and, and look at their paper and see what assumptions they're actually making. Let's talk about recovery. So, in any kind of distributed transaction system, you have to think about how you're, are you going to recover from failures, and these are the failures that are part of your failure model. So, one of the, th one of the one of the uh, types of failures um, that you can get, which is the, the worst type of failure for any type of transaction system, uh, is the server crash. Okay, at least if the network goes down, you, you hope that it's you know, best efforts, that you'll eventually be hooked up again. But if you have a server crash and you're in the middle of writing something to disk, you know, anything that's in your memory buffers gets zapped. Anything that's in your Ethernet buffer buffers are gone. The only thing that you're essentially left with is what's written to disk. And who knows what got written the last few bits are. Maybe those are unrecoverable. Um, in the system R paper, you'll see that even they had um, problems with their disks. So this, we're not going to think about that right now. But if you have problems with your disk, then you have to worry about how to, you know, how to make those more reliable. But this is, this is just bad, right? You, you get turned off. What we need to implement, as we, mentioned, as we talked about before, is this all or nothing semantics. So when, you do, when, you're doing a, when you've committed, and you've told someone you've commit, you have, your promise is that you've done it all. You've done all the updates that you need to do. And if you say that you haven't committed then you, and you abort, then you have to undo any type of, of, of pseudo updates that you were doing. Just undo all of that. So from the outside, you can see the update or not. So what you typically do is, in order to track all those things, you, there's three sets of three pieces of information for any transaction that's, that you're running or nested transaction that you want to keep around. One is object values. So these are the objects that you're changing. You want to know what their original value was, and that's probably stored somewhere uh, you know, and, and on desk. And you also want to know what the new values are going to be. So remember the bank account example where we had a new value that we, that we wrote back with the new uh, uh, amount was that was uh, uh, the balance for the bank. These are the kinds of things that you, for each transaction, even before you commit it, you want to have this type of information in some kind of state where it can be recovered if, if uh, a commit is to happen then you get, and you crash. Um, there's another thing called an intentions list. And this intentions list is um, Correspond. You, you basically these object values. There, there's object IDs that are used to name them, and then something that tells you where I can find it. And the reason you need this where is because you can imagine a transaction that's running can can uh, write a value, and then it can decide, oh, I'm going to write a different value to it, or I'm going to write a different one. You can also imagine that there might be. Um, that the way you structure this, and we'll see later on what, how this is, the way you structure this, this mechan the mechanism is used for recovery. It could be the case that you have uh, these object values kind of splattered throughout some uh, data structure, and you need to find it. So this could be like an index, or it can be a pointer uh, to some inode. It's just all that matters is that you have to be able to know where that object ID is so that you can find its value. And then the last thing that you want to be able to track is the transaction status. And that's whether it's you know, provisionally committed or prepared, or whether it's committed or aborted. So let's see if we let's think of, let's look at a more concrete example of how by tracking these these three types of information, how we can get some uh, robustness against server crashes. And one of the techniques that you can use is called logging. And the idea here is that you have this log. If you're if you're someone who's doing a just involved in distributed in, in a tra any type of transaction actually, um, this works fine for for simple transactions. You have this log, and what do you put in that log? Well, you put this type of information in there. Someone says, um, if someone says uh, I'm going to start a transaction, then that's a transaction status type of record. Okay, so what if uh, what if during part of this I say write you know the balance of uh, change the account balance of this account to something else. Oh, okay. Well, there's an. What I'm going to do is um, 
I'm going to put a value of 30k, and that's a new account balance. And then I'm going to put in my intentions list, I'm going to say that this object, that this, uh, I'm going to name it, I'm just going to give it a, a standard name, balance account. That's a pretty unique name. Is, um, is at this point in the log, let's say this is um, P1. And so I'm going to keep going here. And as there's other objects that, I, that, that my transaction is modifying, I'm going to put their values in here. And I'm going to put some kind of intention records that tells me that this object has, you know, has been modified. And here's where, it, here's where it is. And just keep doing that. I'm yes. Sorry, I'm uh -huh. sorry, I missed the, the intention is to set the balance to 30,000 or to do what? Um, well, yeah, at some point, the reason that you want have one of these in here is that when you commit, when you commit, these changes that are being made to these objects have to be visible to everybody else. And so, right, if the balance is down here, it's stored somewhere down here on disk, right, this is where your current balance is, 100 bucks, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and <laughs> right, and so this is the this is the like the the master version of of the balance. If you have a um, if you have a lock on balance that allows other people to uh, that keeps other people from reading or writing it, then the transaction system will you know can put a lock here and say you know no one no one can touch this except for you know, this current transaction that's running. You may have a different type of transaction where reads are allowed but not writes or and then, then in this case, you could still read this value, and, and this right here could continue. Um, and so, I mean, it gets back down to the question that was asked before. You know, what are all these transactions about? They're about really they're about changing the state of something, of some data. And so, in the end, when you commit, what you're really doing is just committing. You're you're changing the state of the 10 or 100 or however many pieces of of data that are out there. In the date book example, you're changing the state of someone's date book. You know, the 11 o'clock slot from, you know, not uh, empty to, to you, you know, meeting, at, meeting somewhere uh, in the building. And that's what happens when you commit. So this is, here this log is just going to be a record for each transaction that's running of what kinds of changes it's thinking of making if it commits. Um, what you do then is if you, once you get to a point where someone says, I'm provisionally going to commit. So one of these nested transactions says, okay, I've, I'm, I'm done. So I'm going to provisionally commit and that there weren't any failures along the way. Then what you do is you write another one of these um, transaction status records. And you say, this transaction is uh, you know, provisionally commit and it's, it's ID5. Once you do that, then there's what's the notion there's a notion of a recovery manager so up to this point what happens if some if the if the disk crashes and you have this this some failure well there's something here that's going to get something here's going to get messed up but guess what as long as you didn't reply back to somebody to say you know yes i carry this out or yes you know then that then that other person then the, the other entity that's court that's one of the that's coordinating this is going to assume that you either had a crash or that the network was down but if but there's no there's no guarantee yet that anything's committed or that anything's even been received once you get back once the coordinator gets back a provisional commit it has to have some level of guarantee that the stuff that's going to be written out is in some you know has in some reasonable safe place so that's where the recovery manager comes in. Once you, once you write this, uh, this uh, provisional commit record, what you do is you take, you go through, and in this log, and there can be lots of different records being written in between any of these, you go through and you figure out where are all the pieces that belong to this transaction. So you'll have this piece here. You'll have this here. You'll have this here. You'll have this here. And... Maybe that's it. Maybe there's only these four pieces. And you'll copy these over into the recovery manager. Then what happens is suppose that someone comes back and says, oh, okay, let's actually commit this thing. Well, what you'll do is you'll say, okay, 
commit for transaction ID 5. Transaction ID 5. Commit. Once this is forced, once you once this write is complete and you know it's on there, and this and the it's part of the, the data structure the recovery manager can access, then you've committed this transaction. Okay, that you can report back a commit. Now there's still work to do, and, but at that that's the point in the earliest point in time. Once this recovery manager has this record here, that you can that you can commit. Yes. Why do you need the recovery manager? I was hoping somebody would ask that. <laughs> Okay, so why, so can someone give me some reasons why you would want this recovery manager? It's redundant. What do you get when you get redundancy? Fault tolerance. Fault tolerance. So there's some amount of fault tolerance here. If the media that you're using is, uh, is unreliable, which in system R actually you got some, uh, you got some sense that there was potentially some unreliability, then now you have this data in, in two places. So that gives you some amount, but there are other considerations. What are what? what uh huh. Can you have <coughs> um, a perfectly legitimate transaction which only required a final commit when the server went down, and the recovery manager would then have all of it down, complete it when it started up again? Yeah, a and but you can if it's redundant here, then you can do that by going through the log. In this case, there's a there's a recovery manager, and but the, and the question is why? I mean, one thing you could do is just start munching through this log here, whenever you, whenever you were, um, whenever you came back up, if you crashed. But what does it buy you to have this separate thing over here? In speed. The, speed. Okay, that's really important. Remember, speed is important in these things. Where do you get speed? Well, one piece of speed is how fast does it take to do a commit? It's like, boom, boom, right? You might, you, I mean, just two writes, you're done. Right? Instead of, imagine if your commit involved having to go through and, and, you know, at some point, like, figure out what's there, and there's all this work that's gotta be done later, which you've already done by the point, at the point of the commit. So this record here now is, is ready to go. It's all in one place. You don't have to go searching through anything. It's there. You can just, you know, map these things and, and do the work. So it makes the commit return faster. Um, because all this, all this thing is ready to, uh, I'm sorry, sorry. The commit returns faster, but you also get the, what the, when the, um, recovery manager is actually running and saving this stuff, it's all in one place right there. So you don't have to go and start searching for this. Now, what that means also is that this log, remember this, you don't have infinite disk space. So there has to be something that's coming through and cleaning up this log. Right? And so let's think about the complication there. If you're coming through and cleaning up this log, there's all these different references that you have to make to, to, to see like what transactions have been aborted and you take all that information out and then you condense the rest of the stuff. It's a lot like garbage collection. You know, the, remember you guys did the, the compression. When you get fragmentation, you can compress everything down. Well, this log here, there's going to be all sorts of data in there about aborted transactions. And to scrunch this log back down when it starts running out of room, you have to go through and find where all these are. And you can, that, that's expensive doing that. Um, you'd love to be able to have that piece happen independently of being able to run through committed transactions. So if you actually have some other, some other process that has a copy here of what it's going to do and it's fast, then when you come up here, this log, now the log manager can run, you know, concurrently or independently because this thing's just taking things out. And guess what else? It can start taking out these records here, the aborted ones and the committed ones, because the committed ones are already saved over here. So you get an extra performance boost. So yes? The recovery manager only arises in the case of a server um, failure, right? It's not going no matter. Is it? I mean, is it running? It, yeah, it'll, it'll be running. It's called the recovery manager because whenever there's, whenever things need to recover, something needs to recover, that's what's called. But it is the thing that's actually going to go through and start writing this stuff out. Then I don't get, you said there's a lot of different transactions in between. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that can be going on here. So I don't understand why the recovery manager isn't simply a copy of what the log, because there's a bunch of different transactions going on. If it needs, if because the ones that are, the only ones that, for this log here, the ones that it has to worry about are the ones that are actually, the only ones it really cares about are the ones that it has to commit. Up here, there may be a lot of aborts going on. Uh -huh. 
And so you want to minimize any kind of aborts that you have down here because you want this thing to just, its sole purpose in life is to blast through some contiguous set here and just write that stuff out and be done with it. You don't want it to be going through this huge log where there's a lot of aborts and, you know, things are waiting for timeouts and, you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going on up here, hundreds of transactions per second. And what you want down here is like anything that's just, that's been able to commit. And it just, or in a way that it can just blast through it. How does it know that it's going to get that commit down there before it's reached? Does that mean it's putting the t t transaction ID 5 start 30,000, all that yeah. before it's even reached the commit? So what it does is it puts the, when it's provisionally um, committed, it writes this thing out. And then there's two possibilities. So we haven't gotten to the other one. One is that a commit happens. And the other one is that it actually, you get a vote out in it and it's an abort. But what happens in this case, if you get some abort there, well, here's the thing that it is. It's all in one place, gone. Whereas over here, what, if you want to clean up this log from aborts, you can have all sorts of interleaved values that you, have to, that you have to get rid of, and then you have to do this kind of compression. And over here, you can just blow it away. So it, it, there's a lot of the performance issues here are ones that, that really impact why you would want this type of, of dual system and the independence here. So it doesn't actually go into the recovery manager until you're in the provisional commit stage, which is then when you go run through your log. And That's right. That's right. And the other thing that you get, let's, take, let's do a little bit of case analysis. Suppose that you're in the recovery manager and you're starting to, and you say, okay, well, I, I want to, you know, I need to commit anything that's committed here. So what are you going to have? You're going to have some things, anything that's aborted, you know, you can just blow away and you don't have to worry about. Anything that's committed, you have to worry about it in the usual sense. But assume that, let's, let's look at the third case, which is that you have some records that are prepared. Okay, the question is, what do you do with those records that are prepared um, if, you, if you crash? Well, if you crash, let's, 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 uh, let's figure out an, an algorithm, one algorithm that you could use. One algorithm is, if you crash and you're prepared, um, then you just keep going and do all the commit, you know, keep, do the recovery manager, make sure the state of everything's inconsistent and just keep these prepared things around and just wait for something to come back and say commit or abort. That's pretty straightforward. But let's say you want to have a little bit more robustness in there because what can happen in that case? Well, what can happen in that case is suppose that you, you keep crashing because it's, you know, some ad, sys, sysadmin that doesn't know what he or she's doing is, and you just keep crashing. Imagine that the recovery manager in that case says, okay, if I keep crashing like a couple times, I'm just going to abort anything in this, in this state unilaterally. So I'm just going to write abort records next to all of these, and I'm going to send these packets out and try to get that out. How does that help you? If you're crashing repeatedly and you, just, you say, I'm just going to abort these things that I haven't committed yet. Think about our example before. What was one of the things you? What it was one of the objectives there? Pardon? You want to be able to roll everything back, but remember, there's the performance objective, right. right? You want something. You want these things to be speedy. You want a response back quickly that says yes or no. If this is in a state where it just keeps crashing, or there's some there's some issues that the, the recovery manager can't, where it doesn't know what it is, it might be better just to abort because guess what? Someone else out there might have a better way to do it than deal with you know, me, who, the server, who's having all these problems right now. So that's another way where you can just, this recovery manager, when it's running, it can very quickly figure out you know, what's, what's prepared, what's not. If it feels like it's cra it keeps crashing, then it, can, then it can just unilaterally abort and try to get those messages out as best, as best it can, better performance that way. Techniques like this, um, depend, you know, the recovery manager, you're going to write it with a, with a lot of assumptions built in. It's going to depend on um, the reliability of your servers, the reliability of your network, the expanse of your network, how many um, participants do you think they're going to be in a transaction. All those kinds of elements are going to affect what, how you end up writing this recovery algorithm. And it's, there's, no, there's no real rocket science in it as long as, you have, as long as the assumptions are things that that you know, that you understand up front, um, and given that you've done algorithms before, it's probably would be pretty easy for you guys to write one of these, if if you knew what you were writing against. Yes. I'm just wondering if you'd ever use the recovery manager for things other than just a hardware crash, if you're in a distributed system. Things Whether other than a hardware crash. 
I, I don't know, I was trying to figure out mm -hmm. whether, for example, you've got nested transactions, you're waiting on the final commit, there's a timeout, you've, you've got the locks mm -hmm. all in place, the timeout says release the locks, mm -hmm. so you have to release the locks, so then in theory you should have bought, but you could optimize by when you're up again saying, oh, has anything happened to all of that data, no, bang. If you have the locks, yeah, if you have the, once you release the locks, then it becomes, you basically have to abort if you haven't done any of the, of the updates. Um, but if you still have the locks around, then you could, you could say, I'm gonna, you know, I'm, if they're still around, then I can still, then I can still commit. Questions? So there's one other thing that we have to do here when, if we're doing the two-phase commit. So this, this logging that I presented here is just is, is a, is a general model. If you're doing the two-phase commit, remember there's another state that you can have these, um, these leaves in, which is this uncertain state or the one where it's sort of provisionally committed and it's waiting for something to happen. Um, that, that's, that, you know, this provisionally commit or uncertain has to be has to be something that is is part of this. You write this over here, like we talked about in the in the recovery manager, and analogous to that, the the server now has to have something that says done. Now it's this the done the commit the done commit message will have will allow the coordinator um, the coordinator server to know when one of these things that it, that it has is, is done when one of these transactions is finished. And when it is, then it can just, you know, it, is, it can assume that everybody out there has already communicated that back. Every, it's out there in stable storage. And this transaction is something that I don't need to worry about anymore. Throw it out on tape or on DVD or whatever as a, as a record, and, that, and that's it. The main takeaways here are if you understand the model, understand the issues, there's a lot of work that's, that, go, that goes around these transactions, around the, how you, the phases for committing. And when you start thinking about database, distributed databases, this type of understanding is, is, is the foundation of that. So I don't know if the, guy, if the person who's going to teach that is how, what level they're going to teach it. But um, it, immediately, if you start getting into that, these types, of proto, these types of protocols are interesting. And the other thing is that optimizing these types of systems isn't trivial. Example, the recovery manager. If you write a recovery manager based on a set of assumptions, and those assumptions start changing over time, the question is, well, do you have to rewrite the recovery manager? Well, your answer might be, well, no, not if I wrote it so that it takes certain parameters the first time. Well, then all of a sudden, this recovery manager starts becoming more complicated because you have to give, give it a lot of different parameters. So then you get into this trade-off of, like, can my recovery manager do everything, and at what point is it going to not is, is it going to be unoptimized based on the assumptions for the system? That's a scaling issue, right? As you start building out the uh, scaling out, what happens to the to the to its mechanisms? So keep those things in mind. Um, the system R paper um, is a really good example of a, of a place where these guys thought about a lot of these issues and had answers to a lot of these issues. And you go through, and I think it's a pretty a fun read in the sense that. You know, they, they say, here's the, here's the problem, and here's the answer, and we had all these disks failing, and we hate that, that if you had a bunch of our installations out there, there's, you know, we, we're going to end up getting a, approximately one failure per month, and that really sucks. And, you know, they go through all this stuff. Um, so you can really see they're trying hard, and a lot of those things still apply. Thanks very much.